Doulas of color are spreading in West Michigan, such as How You Birth Doula Initiative in Muskegon and Rooted Birth Justice in Kalamazoo. But big news happened this year when the state of Michigan approved doula services to be covered by Medicaid insurance, expanding access to care. Mutually Inclusive's Jennifer Moss caught up with Vanessa Green from Grand Rapids African American Health Institute, also known as GRAHI, to talk about the impacts. Vanessa Green, CEO of GRAHI, we want to welcome you to Mutually Inclusive today, and we really do appreciate you taking time to be here with us. Well, thank you for inviting me, and I'm so happy to be here. So, you know, before we talk more about doulas and the growing representation in the African American community, we're going to take a little bit of a deeper dive uh, into maternal mortality overall among persons of color, mm -hmm. um, specifically African American women. To start, and we've got some devastating and kind of astounding statistics, and they mm -hmm. have been cured and curated by Grahai. So I just want to list a couple of things. Pregnancy-related deaths among black women, three to four times higher than among white women, regardless of income or educational levels. In Michigan, maternal mortality, the rate there doubled from 2018 to 2019. That's a rate of 23.3 pregnancy-related maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. According to the Michigan Maternal Mortality Surveillance Program, more than 63% of that increase were preventable. Correct. And then one more. There's a 2021 report uh, published by the University of California, Los Angeles, uh, the United States, is the most, says it's the, the United States is the most dangerous country in the developed world for pregnant black women. Mm -hmm. These are astounding numbers, mm -hmm. astounding statistics, and, and quite actually devastating and depressing statistics, mm -hmm. to be mm -hmm. honest. So Grahai is known for looking deeper, taking a look, you do your own studies, you have information, and, and, and you even offer hope to persons of color and to to the community at large, let's just say that as well. What have you discovered um, recently, because you're doing current studies as well, behind some of these numbers? What, what is the reason why? A lot of people want to know, because there's, there's no income or educational separation. Right. What would we look at as to the numbers behind maternal mortality in the African American community? Yeah, I, well, I really uh, applaud you for having this conversation because it is critically important in the African-American community and any community because the fact is that maternal health and maternal mortality rates is significantly in fact affecting women of all races. Uh, the challenges is that it's impacting African-American women at even a higher rate than other racial ethnic groups. Uh, but, and so there's not one, there's not one a factor, but it's really multidimensional and multifaceted. And one of the things that we hear constantly, because we're in the community, we're talking to uh, pregnant women all the time, and uh, most of them say they talk about their discomfort and how they're treated when they go into uh, healthcare, and particularly they feel rushed through. Um, so there's not a holistic. Um, evaluation of what their experiences are. And for people who know the African-American community, we laugh when we feel like crying, right? Mm -hmm. And so we carry stress in a whole different way. And so if we're not, if uh, our medical care providers are not looking at us holistically in terms of our lived experiences and the trauma that we experience on a daily basis, when we're in pregnancy and carrying, you know, babies in our womb, they're also carrying, you know, the stressors that we are, um, you know, dealing with in our lives. And when that's not part of the care uh, process, then it can significantly impact the outcome of women. For example, um, when you think about uh, aneurysms and a woman going to the doctor and say, I've been having severe headaches, you know, for weeks and it's not thoroughly examined. And then you go into, you know, situations where you have an aneurysm during pregnancy and then we're losing women. So it's just a number of factors being listened to, being understood, probing when we go into the visits and so forth to uh, find out, you know, what kind of symptoms that we may be having that we may not even mm -hmm. uh, realize is important to share. So there's just a number of, of factors uh, that's affecting uh, these disparities and these outcomes. And where do you think, um, or what do you think the reason perhaps is behind those factors? Is it an systemic look 
um, or retrospective of mm -hmm. racial disparities? Mm -hmm. um, is it systemic mm -hmm. racism? I mean, is, right. is it in grained in society to look and eh, maybe they don't need I mean what is right. it because a lot of people mm -hmm. have their different stories I mean these things these stories aren't made up Correct. things happen Correct. and and there's no slight to the medical mm -hmm. profession because Absolutely. we have wonderful Absolutely. doctors Absolutely. everywhere and I want Absolutely. to start with that because Absolutely. this is not an indictment against doctors I mean we know that they enter the professions because they care about Absolutely. Um, the particular discipline that they are serving in so definitely no no attack against them but it's really important to understand that these dynamics dynamics exist and that the experiences are real and women are dying obviously at uh, significant rates uh, compared to other women. But I, I think that um, part of it is that when you think of systemic like racism and the way we're socialized, we typically are more comfortable with people who look like us, who people who have a shared culture or shared background and experience. And so, for example, if a white woman go into a doctor's office and the physician is white, they have like a mutual like uh, experience in some way that um, allows them to interact and engage differently. And so if there aren't uh, like African-Americans, um, significant African-Americans in the healthcare profession, OB uh, and so forth, then black women don't have that same comfort level when they go in and uh, are meeting with their physicians. And so therefore there's a lot of information, a lot of experiences uh, that they're having that they may not comfortably share just organically and automatically because they have that shared, you know, cultural context. Mm -hmm. And also in, in your studies, have you found that there is, um, has been proven out perhaps maybe a distrust? I mean, you've had your own situation. I mean, so it doesn't come from the wayside. I mean, you, you know Absolutely. personally some things that have Absolutely. occurred. Kind of share your story about that because mm -hmm. there's in some cases, and again, mm -hmm. we wanna make sure that we understand that it's not all cases and right. we have Absolutely. wonderful people in the medical profession, no doubt. Mm -hmm. But the numbers still speak volumes, the Absolutely. statistics, the, store, the, the, the studies that have been done. And right. so you yourself have had a situation w during your first pregnancy. Give us a, an example of what right. happened there. And to your question also, distrust is one of the first things that come up when we're having conversations with black women about their experience with healthcare. And we're working really hard to um, build. And I think that that's one of the uh, ways that doulas can help as well, is help mm -hmm. to uh, build trust between the patient as well as the care provider. And so I did have an experience. Uh, my first pregnancy, I was in my mid-20s. And um, my husband had gotten a promotion and he got transferred. We were living on the east side of Michigan and he got transferred to Grand Rapids. And so I was going to my doctor visits, uh, you know, alone and I had uh, developed a really bad flu and a fever that had lasted for over a week. And so there were concerns, you know, being in my trimester. And so there was pressure from my husband, pressure from my family to go and get it checked out. And so I called my doctor's office, made an appointment. And when I got there, he totally humiliated me and said, you know, this is a waste of my time, why are you here? Uh, a lot of women uh, get the flu during pregnancy and so uh, there was no need for you to come in and he just walked out. So he didn't evaluate me, didn't examine me, didn't try to learn anything more about, you know, what symptoms I was experiencing. Just walked out. He just walked out and at 26 I didn't know um, how to advocate for myself mm -hmm. and so I just left feeling like even more stressed. I was stressed that I had the flu and a fever. And then also now I'm stressed because, you know, I'm totally humiliated. And, and so I just decided that I don't trust the system. You know, if this is the way that, you know, a physician is gonna treat me, then I just won't go back. So what did you do? And so I didn't, I was um, still working on the east side and waited until my eighth month when I moved to Grand Rapids and then I got a new physician and he was fantastic. So to your point, um, not all experiences are negative experiences, but when you have those kinds of um, horrible experiences, then it does prevent you from trusting uh, any other physician. But you're pregnant and you're mm -hmm. in your third trimester. You went months without care. Right. Which is so a danger in and of itself. It's a danger, absolutely. Absolutely. Prenatal care is like so incredibly important and because of the humiliation I denied myself um, to have that ongoing care and mm -hmm. which in turn I could have put myself you know, in a significant at-risk situation. And uh, fortunately, everything turned out mm -hmm. <laughs> well. Yeah. And, you know, my daughter is now an adult. Huh? And so, 
uh, but yeah, but it did create significant distrust uh, in me. Um, and so the new position when I came here had actually uh, served numerous of my family members. And so, you know, they all had had a great experience. So you had and a trust. I did have trust going into that mm -hmm. situation, yes. Absolutely, and, and, and it's not just local people that do that. I mean, we have celebrities who have Correct. cause. Uh, you have a story there as well, Serena Williams. Right. Uh, I mean, it's been brought public. Right, it's definitely. Publicized, mm -hmm. but. Yeah. Well, she her story was that she um, had a history of blood clots, and she was having, like, symptoms, and she knew her body. She knew that her story, and she tried to tell the nurses and the doctor that uh, something was going wrong, and she wanted to. Um, you know, be tested and so forth. And they pretty much ignored her and said she's just reacting to uh, the medication that they had given her. And um, and because, you know, she knew how to advocate for herself, she pushed and advocated. And they had to, uh, then they were forced to examine her and realize that she was having blood clots that really could have led to, um, you know, significant, um, you know, fatal mm -hmm. experience. And mm -hmm. she did have a near-death experience, but because she advocated for herself and they finally listened, uh, then, yes, yeah, she did end up having a safe uh, pregnancy, but she ended up being in the hospital like six weeks, after, you know, after yeah. her baby and, you know, and how hard that is for any new parent when, um, you know, if she'd been listened to and treated and responded to um, sooner, then that experience could have been significantly different. And so again, we go back to trust and, and gaining that trust and getting that trust. And, and this is where um, in, in Kylie's story, we looked at uh, doulas right. playing a significant role right. in the birthing mm -hmm. of uh, African-American uh, babies lately. Right. It, right. There's a growing mm -hmm. um, desire from some Absolutely. And so at the start of the year, mm -hmm. Governor Gretchen Whitmer um, indicated that, and they it moved through the state legislature right. that mm -hmm. we can Thankfully. now, that Medicaid can now mm -hmm. pay for doula services. Right. Your opinion on that, is that a good thing so that that can help other people? How do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, we celebrated. <laughs> so absolutely, we thought that that was a really, really great thing. Uh, it's so important. I mean, when you look at the, the numbers and, um, you know, just the deaths per year and, uh, there's evidence that doulas significantly impact the experience of, um, you know, pregnant women and provide the kind of like resources and support, you know, throughout the pregnancy, emotionally, uh, like physically, and just being able to provide them with um, the advocacy that they may not, because when you're pregnant, I'm telling you, like, <laughs> women were pregnant is, is, is um, quite the experience. Yes, it and is. Sometimes as you're going through, you really don't know um, what the resources are. You don't know what the needs are. And um, just to have someone walk alongside you uh, who is well knowledge about, about you know, the resources and how mm -hmm. to navigate and, and so forth, then it's incredibly helpful. I mean, our men, the husbands are great. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But, you know, just having a doula, you know, with that kind of experience to walk alongside you, I know I wish I'd had a doula. Uh, to support me during my, um, you know, especially during the, the first pregnancy. Especially you the learn first a lot pregnancy. from the first pregnancy. Yes, the you do. Pregnancy. It's not so. We all do. But yes. yes, but definitely during the, the first pregnancy, uh, I'm a huge advocate. I love what they do. And uh, we work with a lot of doulas, and the heart and the passion that they operate under is mm -hmm. uh, incredible. It's just an incredible resource for women. And when you look at the disparities and you have like an opportunity, to like provide this type of support and then for you know the governor to you know approve Medicaid mm -hmm. um, reimbursement it's, it's a big move for um, the communities and uh, we're just looking forward to like how it can impact you know these outcomes and on a final note impacting outcomes that's right. key and mm -hmm. that is again what Grahai intends yes. to do yes. through supporting things such as the doula initiative as well as you have a current study we can't right. touch a lot upon that but you mm -hmm. do have new studies coming we out studies. that will give information to mm -hmm. hopefully uh, creating better health uh, mm -hmm. circumstances for people in our community. Absolutely, yes, All yes. Right. So we're constantly doing research, having focus groups, learning about the experiences, and then using that information to improve our services and uh, the ways that doulas can continue to uh, enhance you know, their support of women, pregnant women. So really excited. Absolutely, and we look forward to that report. Vanessa Green, CEO of Grahai, thank you so much for joining us today. We greatly appreciate your time. Thank you, I appreciate you doing this story. It's incredibly important.